Hey, my name is Jordan, and I want to welcome you guys to the webinar. I'm going to get out of the way real quick and hand it off to Jay, because that's that's who you guys are here to talk to. A few things about kind of how we'll go so you can get questions answered, and you guys can make this as useful as possible for you and your school. Um, if you got questions, uh, throw them in the chat uh, as we go, and if if me or my colleague Hannah can answer them, we'll answer them as we go. And if it's something we can ask Jay, we'll ask him, like as the breaks goes, we'll ask him throughout questions. So if you got something you need clarified or asked, please drop in the chat. We'll make sure it gets asked. Um, if you want to ask questions at the end, we will have some time for that as well. So if you want to want to uh, speak up at the end, that's fine too. Um, if you would like a copy of these slides or recording, those will be sent out after we finish and with a follow-up email. And without further ado, we are here with uh, Mr. Jay Mains. He's a principal at Del Valle Elementary. He is uh, about to run an Ironman. He's, he's nice enough to join us right before he goes. So, Jay, I'm going to hand it off to you. And thank you, sir. Thank you, Jordan, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. I, like uh, Jordan said, I'm the proud principal of Del Valle Elementary School in Del Valle, Texas. We are on the east side of Austin. We're not part of Austin ISD. We're just on just outside of the Austin ISD district. We're our own entity. Um, I've been with uh, that school district for about 10 years now, and I'm super proud of the work that we have done, which uh, includes uh, a lot of work on behavior and uh, the use of live schools. So I, when I came into uh, the assistant principal position in 2013 at my school, I was, I was teaching math on Friday and I was AP on Monday. So it was, uh, it was uh, quite a transition and I had to so learn some things uh, really fast and I learned some things not so fast. So I feel like I've always wanted to, to reach out to, to others and, and share what I've learned. And uh, I put that together here to try to help you ensure authenticity in your PBIS system. Sure, we're all trying and we're all uh, working hard to make sure we have a system and it's working, but how do we really make sure that it is working the way we want it to? So, um, Come along with me and we'll uh, go through uh, this presentation and how we did that. All right. And we've had our first snag, Jordan. It won't let me advance my slides, but I'm going to give it a second here. There we go. All right. That's just a QR code that has a little bit about me on it. If you're interested in my credentials, there it is. No pressure. But um, the learning intention for us today is we're going to evaluate the barriers and some solutions to ensuring positivity and fidelity in the PBIS system. Right. Um, we're gonna identify it. You're gonna be able to identify barriers to positivity on your own campus. Uh, you're gonna uh, see some of uh, the ideas that we use and see if you can use them on your own campus to simplify the positivity and then what modifications that you wanna to make to your campus systems. All right, but here's the, Here's the, the numbers for you. Like, do we really need to listen to this guy? Well, check this out. When my, my first year as assistant principal, we had 276 referrals and 88 kiddos receiving exclusionary discipline, in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, et cetera. Um, the next year, 241 referrals, 82 incidents of exclusionary discipline. And then the next year, that drops to 63 referrals and 41 incidents of exclusionary discipline. And you can probably guess that there at the end of 2014, 2015, uh, we polished up a lot of our PBIS systems and introduced live school. And I feel like that, that is what cut that down by what, 75% uh, in that one year on referrals. Um, and then you can see the, the progress we made continuing to reduce the referrals, continuing to reduce the exclusionary discipline through, the, through COVID. So I kind of excluded the COVID data because it's, it's not fair really to compare to those ones, uh, those years before COVID, but um, you know, the numbers are still good. Uh, it's just very different numbers. So I didn't throw them in to confuse anything. So uh, that's what I feel proud about uh, all the work that we did, you know, reducing those referrals and reducing those exclusionary discipline numbers. And uh, it was advertised to you through live school as, you know, reducing referrals um, as a, uh, Behavior purist, I uh, say, you know, behavior numbers, uh, referral numbers are important, but, you know, keeping our kids in the classroom, I feel is the most important. So I really look at that exclusionary discipline number. That's the number that I'm proud of. And uh, so I'm gonna show you now, you know, how we, how we did that. But first, you know, if you wanna know a little bit about my background, I've taught uh, in grades six through 12 and assistant principal in pre-K through five. I was a health educator 
taught community health, uh, got my master's in education administration, um, I've taught high school math up to calculus, um, and then now I'm at a school that has uh, three-year-olds through fifth grade. So I've kind of seen behavior on a, on a spectrum. The one high school math uh, position I was in too was at a school where all the kiddos were, had committed a crime of some type. So the behavior was, was different there. So I've learned a lot about behavior uh, through the years through those different settings. But the school I'm at now, uh, Del Valley Elementary, we're a Title I school, 89.3% uh, free reduced lunch. Over the last 10 years, that's ranged from 84 to 89. We've had somewhere between 600 and 1,000 students in there, um, maybe 40 to 50% limited English or emergent bilinguals. And then just, you know, just so you know, we've been trying everything. We've been trying MTSS, PBIS, conscious discipline, restorative practices, mindfulness, capturing kids' hearts. We've been really uh, researching lots of things on behavior and trying things out and and seeing what's practical and what sticks. And we, I feel like we have a good mix of all those things here that we're gonna talk about today. Um, so what is it that makes our teachers different? We have to do lots of observations, right? And we know that teacher with a really good classroom management is very different from the teacher that doesn't have classroom, very good classroom management. And what is the difference? And the, the couple of the main differences you probably know this is they uh, connect the students differently and they also have uh, uh, skills in connecting and uh, directing students uh, when they have good classroom management. And the, uh, the teachers who struggle there, you see them constantly here on the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. They're constantly worried about their, uh, their uh, safety and um, the physical needs of the classroom. They, they have trouble getting to the really complex topics of the lesson because they're dealing with uh, the safety issues in the classroom or dealing with behavior. So our goal is to give student, that, sorry, teachers the skills so that they can move up on Maslow's hierarchy. So they're, they're, the safety issues come more naturally and they have skills to, to intervene and they're not so uh, worried about those so they can uh, teach the kiddos those higher order thinking skills. I talk with my teachers all the time about um, what we expect from our teachers in our classrooms and I need our teachers working on a high level. We need our students working at a high level. This is Hamill's pyramid of human capability. And um, this is, you know, first thing every year we talk about, uh, I need you to be more than obedient, showing up and doing your job. I need you to be more than diligent, trying hard to do your best. I need you doing more than just applying uh, uh, problem solving and intellect to your job, right? I need you taking initiative. I need you being creative. I need you to be, uh, helping our kiddos uh, learn these um, high order thinking skills too. So um, in order to do that, I need you to get out of, I need you to develop the skills to get away from just worrying about behavior in the physical environment all the time. So with, let's work together to give you these skills, follow our plan, and you'll be working in the passion, passionate, zealous, creative uh, area of this pyramid rather than reacting to behavior issues. That make sense? So we cover this right from the beginning, right? So I'm guessing that you're probably somewhere along this spectrum somewhere. You're, you're attempting PBIS and MTSS, multi-tier systems of support. You've, you probably have a campus motto and expectations. Ours is SOAR, safety, ownership, achievement, and respect. You probably have something like that already set up. Uh, you probably have a token system, some type of bucks you're giving out. Ours are owl bucks, right? You got them on, probably have them on paper or you're thinking about making the jump to digital currency. Um, and you probably have um, a tiered behavior program. And this is where we were in 2014. We had, uh, quotes, established all of these things. These things existed, but what, what really was, how well were they being implemented and uh, what kind of fidelity did we have in those systems uh, was really the question. So I, the more I examined what we were doing, the, the more the, the barriers popped out. What was keeping us from being successful and what made teachers that were successful successful and ones that weren't not successful. And these are them, take your phone out, take a photo of these because these are the main barriers to that have your PBI system not work, right? One, what are the roles of the folks with different people on campus? Do you have common expectations? What are they? How are they used? How do you redirect students? How do you manage those bucks? 
uh, how do you track the fidelity of your system, and how do you connect to the home to the school. And we're going to go through each one of these and talk about how uh, we were able to, to manage all these and get those referrals down by 80 plus percent and get those exclusionary disciplines way down too. All right. So first of all, who's responsible for what? When I started this, the assistant principal, some teachers thought, I never need to talk to you. Uh, I've got my system, I got my uh, behavior program down in my classroom, we're all set. Other teachers thought that I needed to handle everything. Um, and that uh, the teachers who had good classroom management were empowered to take care of issues in the classroom and the teachers with low classroom management, uh, I was taking the power away from them by doing things for them. All right, so we really sat down and examined our discipline matrix. And instead of making a, uh, this infraction equals this uh, consequence, we talked about who was responsible for what. And we, we named behaviors green, yellow, orange, red. Green behavior is the ones we want. Yellow behaviors, things uh, we don't want the students doing. Orange are a little more intense and red are super intense, right? And we want our teachers to be able to handle the green and the yellow. And I can, even with some assistance, help them with the orange behaviors. So we define what those behaviors are. And the yellow behaviors, teachers, we want you to be able to do those in the classroom quickly, swiftly, get back to teaching. Um, orange, we collaborate on those. Uh, if you feel confident, you can uh, redirect that behavior and get back. Great. If uh, if we will need an ad administrator collaboration, maybe someone from the behavior team to help you uh, with that, uh, we can collaborate on that one. And then the red ones, the red ones are keeping you from doing your job. They're safety concerns. They are serious uh, behavior incidents. We want you to uh, get our attention so we can uh, make sure your classroom is safe and you can get back to work. Right. Um, we don't want that necessarily for the yellow behaviors. We want you to be able to swiftly move it along, but the red behaviors, uh, we're going to uh, have the admin team, behavior team uh, help you with those. So that was our first thing, establish who's, in, who's responsible for what. It came up too that, you know, hey, we're responsible for that, but what are the things that we can do? So we added to the discipline matrix uh, things that could happen, possible consequences, not required consequences. I think possible consequences are, are much better. And then the teacher interventions that could happen as well. Okay, so first challenge was who's responsible for what? And we sat down and clearly defined it. Everybody has this in the room, if it's hanging up or it's on their desk. So, uh, and we go over it frequently in our team meetings so that uh, everybody knows uh, who's responsible for what. All right, the second challenge, student gets in trouble. I get called in to assist. I ask the kiddo what's going on. And they say, I wasn't doing nothing. And, uh, and it, like, clearly you were doing something or the teacher wouldn't have called me, right? Um, but it, it, it became apparent that there was a disconnect between what the teacher's expectations were and what the student's idea of the teacher's expectations. So is there a way to make expectations clear? And uh, we, we looked around at lots of different ways to do that. And it turns out we feel like the CHAMP system is the best way for teachers to set expectations and have those expectations be clearly defined. And so there's no question, no doubt. And the expectations stay posted and present throughout the lesson so that students know what they are. If you're unfamiliar with CHAMPs, this is kind of an example of one teacher's CHAMPs board. CHAMPs, the C stands for conversation. How do we want the students talking and communicating? H is for help. How do we want them to get help? Do we want them to get out of their seat? Just raise your hand, ask a friend. Uh, a is for activity. Is this, a, is this group work? Is this individual work? Um, am I working on my own or am I uh, watching the teacher? Um, what part of the I do, you do, I do, we do, you do, are we in? Uh, M is for movement. Uh, is this a time where we get up and get water when we want to? Or do we stay seated for this because this is a super important part of the lesson? Or is this our uh, center's time? And uh, you know, if you need to use the restroom, you can go use the restroom and get right back to work. And then P is for participation. Um, how is that work going to be submitted? Is it individual or a group or partner work? So, and you can see over on the side, the teacher has a little magnet that shows the students which aspect of champs they're expected to be following right now. So if a teacher says, hey, I need everybody to be quiet for 10 minutes and just continues teaching, uh, Maybe students forget they're supposed to be quiet or how long 10 minutes is, or does she really want us quiet now? Um, but champs, this board stays up there and you adjust the, the magnet, it's there forever. And, 
and, and uh, so it's clear for the teacher and the student what the expectation is. All right. So, and there's a couple. There, you know, there's different versions of the Champs board. Um, from um, there's a, a this one has little visuals to it, right? Our kindergarten pre-K teachers have many more visuals in their Champs, um, but I'll have teachers that use lights, um, teachers that uh, use magnets, uh, Velcro, different ways uh, to to show off some creativity of the teacher, and then also make sure that the the expectations are being displayed. One of the other neat things I found doing observations of teachers in their PBIS system is that there was a challenge with how to redirect kids. And our very talented, very skilled teachers have quick, efficient redirects that don't uh, interrupt the flow of their lesson. Um, and I found that uh, teachers with um, struggling with class classroom management I didn't have that skill. And um, a teacher said one time, you know, the redirect is in champs. It's, you don't have to make anything up. You could actually just say to a student who's not following the, the expectations, hey, check champs real quick. And um, that takes you away from that. How many times was I tell you to be quiet? I really remember, we're not talking right now. Oh, this is the fourth time today I've had to tell you to be quiet. Don't need to do that. <laughs> There's no need to, to break your flow. Just check champs. Oh, everybody check champs real quick. Uh, what does champs say right now? Uh, it keeps the, the language positive as well, right? It's not a, oh my gosh, I have to tell you again, right? And you get that negativity into the atmosphere that we're trying to avoid with PBIS. You know, this, this keeps it a very neutral uh, way of reminding students of the expectations and keeping them, uh, getting them back on track. And of course they need to, even if it is posted, sometimes they need reminders and uh, that's what it's there for. This not only helps the, with that positive flow of, uh, in the classroom, in the, in the uh, students being redirected in a neutral to positive way, but it also helps teachers' uh, mentality uh, at the end of the day. Uh, when they leave the classroom at the end of the day, they, they feel less worn out when their, their redirects are positive or neutral versus uh, feeling like they're chasing people around saying negative redirects. So this really empowers the, the teachers to uh, have words that are effective at redirecting and not having them have to go down that, that negative road and leave at the end of the day feeling frustrated. Hey, Jay. Yes, sir. We had a good question in the chat uh -huh. that for good good chance for clarification. Yeah. Um, do you use champs across every classroom? Is that correct? Every classroom is required, yes. Yes. Thanks, sir. Yes. And um, like a lot of these, a lot of these things, when we we start out implementing them, you know, teachers will say, Oh, I don't really need that. Um, and then later they say, I'm really glad I have that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and champs is one of those things too, where if you really start strong at the beginning of the year, uh, it's, it's clarification of your norms and clarification of your expectations. And then by January, uh, it's become so much part of your routine and, your, uh, and the understanding of your classroom culture that it be, you become less dependent on it and the students are less dependent on it, they get it. And then you come back from spring break and they need it again, you know, to, to remind them. So yeah, it, uh, if you start out really strong at the beginning of the year, you'll, you'll find that uh, it becomes part of your culture and bec um, you become less reliant on it. And then uh, when you have those big long breaks, uh, it helps for those, uh, you know, reminding them when they come back, All right? Hey, Jay, we had a, a yeah. one more follow-up question to that. Probably yeah. a good chance to answer this one as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dave asked, do you have any old school teachers that really push back in the beginning and how do you address mm -hmm. that? Yes. So um, so it depends on which part, right? Uh, we're going to get to live school in a minute and that one is easy. Uh, but yeah, so the, the pushback in the beginning is, uh, you know, you present them with the data. The, the old school teachers, uh, they've, they've seen a lot. They've been around a lot. They know a lot, uh, but they don't always see themselves in the mirror. So when you go in and give them feedback on uh, how their students were following expectations and what, what they saw versus what you saw, it can, it can really open their eyes about, about hey, maybe, uh, maybe I have a false sense of, of what is actually going on in my classroom, right? Uh, and then I need them to, to remember, hey, you're our experienced teacher and you're our, you're our role model and you have skills that allow you to you know, uh, communicate your expectations, establish your culture quickly. But the teacher next door, she's only been here two years and uh, she really needs to see you do this when she comes observe so that, uh, so that she can get this really established in her room. She's gonna need to do this a lot more consistently and a lot more 
often uh, to, um, to, to get this as part of her practices, you know, as much as you have it down, because you're an expert, you've been doing this for 20 years now. So, but you need to help that other teacher be able to see this and, and do it too. So uh, yeah, helping them be that coach and that leader, and then also giving them uh, the, the data that you see that maybe shows that maybe they're not actually uh, performing where they are, they think they are performing. I think that I think that answers that question a little bit. Yeah. Th yeah. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Uh, the fourth challenge is those bucks. Oh my gosh, the bucks! You got to print the bucks. You got to cut the bucks up. You got to store the bucks. The bucks get lost. They get stolen. They get traded. I'll give you three bucks for a slice of pizza, right? They get donated to students, and all that is kind of tedious for the for the um, teacher too to give out the bucks. It's even more tedious to cash in the bucks, right? Because it's it's treasure box Friday and it's uh, 17 bucks for the for the pencil sharpener and it's 23 bucks for the for the squiggly pencil topper and uh, you know that one's got to be counted out and it just it's so cumbersome that it ends up not happening. That's what I found out, right? Giving out the little paper bucks, I would go in the classrooms and I would watch for 45 minutes and I would see four or five owl bucks given out in in the total time and the Teacher is, feels like they're doing a good job giving them out. Oh, I gave out the bucks. Yeah. Um, but what if there's a better way? <laughs> what if there's a way to give out the bucks more efficiently, faster, in a more meaningful way for students? And that's what we were, we were looking for. And I noticed, oh my gosh, that poor little girl in the back, she is so cute and adorable and she's following all the rules and she never gets a buck because she's always following the rules. But the little guy who struggles with staying in his seat and keeping his hands to himself, we're rewarding him more often because we, we need him uh, we need to, to recognize his good behavior so he so he uh, complies and learns how to uh, manage his behavior, and uh, and the and the kiddos see this right. Like, I'm I'm doing all the right things and I'm not getting any bucks, and this kiddo sometimes um, has challenging behavior, but he gets lots of bucks, and and it's and teachers really trying to do their best, and, uh, but it's just it's cumbersome. All of these aspects of having the, the token system are cumbersome and it makes the system not happen and not happen the way we want it to. Um, so if there's a better way to do that, let's do it. And we found out, we've tried a bunch of different systems, um, Class Dojo, Hero, Lesson, and we found Live School to be by far uh, the best all around system for it. Uh, they're not paying me, I promise you. Um, just, just having tried it, um, this is the best way to, to make sure the kiddos get the bucks. You can quickly and easily give owl bucks to the whole class in seconds. Even the little girl in the back gets the owl bucks. Even the kiddo who needs that constant reinforcement gets the bucks. And you can do it more often in the day. And you can have the students connect their earnings to rewards by redeeming them quicker and easier. Um, it's just, it's just 10,000 times better. Um, than the paper books. Uh, 10,000 is probably not even a good estimate. It's probably even greater than 10,000. Um, the way we use live school, the um, first we started with just fourth grade and boy, did they push back. Woo wee, oh my gosh, this is something extra. One more thing we gotta do. Um, and um, I met the Matt from live school at a, a principal conference. Um, and we started using live school with just one grade level and uh, for just two months. And by the end of that two months, those teachers were like, yes, we need this next year. And let's add a grade level. So we added second grade. And then we added, uh, and then we added fifth grade. And then uh, by the end of that year, we had every grade level on track uh, using live school except pre-K. And then pre-K pushed back, all oh, our kids need uh, concrete, tangible objects they can hold. Um, years later, nope, they play Candy Crush and they play you know, all these games online and they understand virtual points too. Uh, and now we're even our pre-K uses live school. Um, one of the ways we use live school is uh, we establish a threshold and we want all of our students to have the opportunity to earn 25 uh, positive recognitions for their behavior uh, a day. This is uh, one of my second grade classes today. You can see there's 23, 24 points. Um, so the students have had the opportunity to receive at least 25 compliments from their teacher in a school day. 25 seems like a lot when you're handing out the paper box, right? <clears throat> but really it's not that much because uh, remember we have our motto is soar and champs. Let's see if I can get it to pull up here. Um, our motto is soar and champs. So if I select a student and I click on our points, 
here in our points section, you can see we have SOAR, safety, ownership, achievement, and respect. And since a lot of our students speak Spanish, we put it in English and Spanish too. So there, right there, if a student is um, being safe at school, there's a point for it. If they're taking ownership, there it is. All right, and then we use champs, like I said. So here, you'll see champs shows up in our matrix all over the place. So here's in our classroom, conversation, help, movement, participation. So kiddos, uh, we're gonna adjust champs real quick. I need everybody on voice level zero. I need you to raise your hand to get help. We're gonna do a group activity. We're gonna stay in our seat. Everybody's gonna turn in their own pro uh, product at the end. I've established champs. Everybody can see it. I start my lesson. Um, I see a kiddos uh, getting out of a seat. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna give uh, points to all the students who are following champs right now. Click on live school, click all the kids, click the four buttons, click continue. Makes that wonderful noise the kiddos love. Everybody earns points. Everybody gets a clap. Yay, and you move right back on to your lesson. Uh, you do that once every hour for a six hour day, that's 24 points. So we're almost at your thresh, uh, our minimum threshold of 24 points, just in champs, just once every hour. So it's, uh, it's, it's not a lot. We have uh, champs in the hallway. We have champs in the morning. All of our kiddos get breakfast in the morning. Um, and there's a slight intervention time during the morning. Um, we also give points for showing up on Monday and Wednesday, and extra bonus points because our attendance drops on Monday and Wednesday. There's champs in the cafeteria. Uh, there's champs at recess, champs for interventionists, uh, champs at dismissal for assemblies uh, in the library. And then we have our oh no section. Our oh no section is when a teacher needs help. Um, we set it up so that the, um, if a teacher uses one of the points in this section, it automatically emails a member of the administrative team and also our behavior team. So we get an email as an alert uh, student has gotten a negative for a push hit bite in this classroom. It also shows up, the alert shows up uh, kind of how their day's been going, right? Have they gotten a lot of other negatives? Have they gotten a lot of other positives? Is this the first instance today? So we have some background knowledge when we um, see the kiddo. And then we can show up and talk to the kiddo. Uh, I don't even have to talk to the teacher really because the teacher also puts in the note, right? Push hit by teacher, push, uh, student pushed a student, push, student pushed a peer in line at lunch. So I can walk into the cafeteria, see him in, uh, at the table at lunch, pull them aside, have the chat, reestablish expectations. Um, teacher sees the support. Um, student knows that you know we're watching, <laughs> and, uh, and so it's a quick and easy way for uh, someone to get help as well. Um, that's kind of how we have it set up. Uh, one of the great things about uh, having champs and soar in our uh, in our discipline major in our a rubric here is that it requires us to talk about it, right? We have to have discussions. So in your room, you might you might uh, uh, have expectations for behavior that are different than the other teacher. But with champs, we talk about it, and it's nearly the same. And uh, so, what is what does achieving in the restroom look like, right? So we have to have a conversation about that uh, with among our team. So we have those. Um, common expectations throughout the school. Um, and achieving in the restroom in kindergarten is different than in fifth grade a little bit. So, um, you know, we have those common expectations at least on the grade level. So great thing about uh, live school and setting up the rubric the way we do, we incorporate champs in it. Kiddos see champs in it, they see our school model in it, and it allows the teachers uh, to talk to make sure that we have that consistency in our system, which is really what we're looking for, right? That authenticity. All right, we also review the data in our leadership uh, meetings and celebrate. So Live School has the insights button, click on there. Uh, you can see the, the data by student, by roster, by grade, by teacher uh, in the whole school. So you can keep track of how your students are doing. Getting points, you can keep track of how your teachers are doing, giving the points. You can see problem areas uh, by behavior. You can see problem areas by grade. You can see problem areas by teacher. And one of the greatest things for me as a, as a new admin uh, was really just having the thermometer of my school at any one time, right? I can click on a grade level and see how the day is going, right? I can click on uh, a class and see how that class is going. I, um, so I can even be off campus and still keep track, right? Um, and, and know that things are going well on, on my campus. Um, and then I can, you know, I can send somebody to intervene as well, right? So if uh, if I'm off campus and I get it, 
I, I see, hey, OC has got a negative. He's got three negatives already this morning. Let's send the council down there, check in, see what's going on that's, that's um, interfering with that kiddo today. I can also see if it's the teacher. Hey, maybe the teacher had a rough morning, flat tire, and maybe the teacher needs a little walk around the school to blow off some steam so that so the teacher can come back in and get on track too. So uh, that's some of the greatest stuff about, about live hey. schools that, yes, sir. Yeah, I think it's a good chance that I saw two in the chat that probably go right where you are. Awesome. Uh, we had a question from Kathy about um, repeat behavior issues. Uh -huh. um, so that, that kind of that's part one is how, how do you go about uh, dealing with that? Uh -huh. um, and the the second question to that is who's on the behavior team? Yeah. So um, one of the one of the tough parts when you're trying to get a kiddo uh, behavior services is where's the data? Where's the data? Where's the data? Right in law school, we have the data. It's it's in there, uh, and the teachers uh, plug in the points, positive and negative. We got the, the positive things to talk about and the negative things to talk about. This it actually this law school helps you identify the students who need behavior assistance faster. Right, you don't you don't we don't need six weeks to figure out who our our kiddos who, who need support are. We can get it much faster. Right, um, on my behavior team, um, the email goes to. Uh, all the APs, uh, counselor, we have a social worker on campus, um, the uh, behavior teacher and the behavior TAs, and then we have an ISS TA. Um, I also have just some TAs who are skilled in uh, working with and redirecting students, so uh, they can get the alerts as well. Um, yeah, for the repeat behaviors, uh, yeah, Live School helps you track that data, and then you can make decisions as a team you know, we had this behavior recurring on the playground. What are we going to do about it, right? This behavior is uh, recurring with these particular students in this particular class with this particular teacher. You can get that specific uh, about that data, um, even to the time of day, right? It doesn't happen in the morning, it happens in the afternoon. So when you have this, this much data, you can really, really make decisions that impact behavior and not just uh, feel like you're uh, grasping at straws or stabbing in the dark, right? Uh, and then we use the data to celebrate too. You celebrate the kiddos that are doing a great job and you celebrate the teachers who are doing a great job. Um, and uh, yeah, it becomes a competition too, right? When you send out the data of your uh, points per day, it's something that we do. So on my third grade team, this teacher gave out this many points per student per day. Our goal is 25. She hit 23 last week, she's almost there. But the teacher across the hall gave 40, whoa. So now we have a little inter-teacher competition um, and you know they'll they'll work to match each other, right? So celebrating works too. And we've taken it an extra step too, where we use the team, the you guys call it the house point system. We've we called it teams at one point. So we can we have the the team system, the house point system also on our campus, so we can celebrate the the houses that are are performing well also. Hey Jay, this question mm -hmm. might be coming up anyways, but yeah. it's probably a good time to to ask it. And if you're about to answer it, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. um, Christina asked, um, "How do you go about handling distribution of like student store prizes? Do, do you guys have a student store, don't you?" Yeah, so um, I'm not a big fan of the student store. I feel like uh, I feel like trinkets lose their luster. Um, so we end up buying a lot, you know, two hundred dollars worth of Oriental trading trinkets. And then, you know, we give them out for August, September, October, and then by November, eh, we're not, it's not really the motivating thing anymore. So not that, they, not that they never work, I just feel like they, they lose their luster and wear out. So I want our student store to be um, experiences, right? They, I get to sit in the teacher chair, or I get to make a rule, or I get to be the line leader, or I get to be the recess guard, or come up with things that have the students feel good about themselves to establish that intrinsic motivation to, to be a part of the culture and a leader in the culture, rather than that trinket that I'm going to uh, lose on the way home today on my walk home, or it's going to end up in my pencil box and never going to use it. Some students are very effective. I'm not going to say they never work, uh, but I really, like, I really like giving kiddos experiences more. Uh, and make it feel special about something. And then it, it uh, helps with that intrinsic motivation instead of, I always need a trinket to, uh, to, to behave. And, and in reality, the live school points are kind of those trinkets. Um, you know, and, and a lot of uh, behavior, um, you know, people who are, uh, I, I'm just, what I'm looking for, I'm 
so I'm struggling to find the word, behavior purists, they even feel like giving a point as a trinket that a kiddo might not, that might not be beneficial. But I feel like um, giving the points is that, is that little bit of recognition that helps them build that intrinsic desire to be a part of the culture, right? So eventually, right, by May, maybe they don't need the point anymore, but, um, you know, and maybe they don't need the trinket anymore either. So, uh, but at the beginning, we give out lots of points, build up that part of the culture um, so that so that we can uh, be consistent in our systems, right? Um, I, I got both of those. One, oh, the school store. Yeah, the school store is tough, man, because especially with the paper bucks, oh my gosh, so tough to do with the paper bucks. Um, so we've done it a couple of different ways. We In our school store, we've labeled specific items. So you gotta take the time to add the button for the specific item and the price of it. Then you gotta worry about the economy, like, are my fourth grade teachers giving out 50 bucks a day, but my second grader is giving out 25 bucks a day. So is the pencil topper 150 bucks or is it 80 bucks, right? Depending on the grade. So it kind of becomes the economy part kind of becomes some extra work. So um, one of the geniuses on our campus, they said, let's just make the buttons worth an amount. And then the grade level can establish um, the amount based on the economy of that grade level. And then, uh, and then the teacher just goes in and hits the grade level. It did, sorry, the amount, it deducts the amount. Um, and then you don't have to worry about getting the economy uh, nailed down for the whole school um, specifically. Um, and that, that really helped a bunch to be able to empower teachers to, to use the book system and to use the rewards part. That, that's, that's a very cool way of adding some yeah. economy for teachers too. Yeah, and it, it, it helped overcome that barrier of using it um, and that, you know, eventually we might get back to the point where we have everything broken down by points, but but right now it's working for us, so we're we're going to keep going with that one. And then that fifth challenge: How do you know the teachers using it correctly when uh, when they were giving out the paper bucks? I had no idea. Right, I would go in and watch for a while, and I could tell the teacher later, "Hey, you gave out four bucks in the twenty minutes I was there." Um, but with the with the digital system, it's it's obvious, and you can check it on the fly in a second. Break it down by teacher, by student, by day. Um, reports you can run, uh, it's, it's just at your fingertips all the time. Um, so there's, there's no doubt who's using the system and who's using it correctly. The other great thing is it tells you who needs help, right? So if you have a classroom full of red points for the demerits, then I know that teacher is dealing in that low end of Maslow's hierarchy. They're on the low end of Hamill's pyramid. They don't have necessarily the skills. They don't feel uh, their their skills are doing what they need to do to redirect student behavior and to have a positive culture. So that's where we're going to apply our energy. Let's get a mentor. Let's get the grade level leader in there. Let's have them watch other people. Uh, it shows up very quickly who needs the who needs the help. All right. So the fifth challenge is solved there. And then that homeschool connection. Oh my gosh. Um, how do you get? what's happening at school to become important at home? How do you communicate it quickly? And uh, Live School's added the snapshot system that sends it home to the parents. So if the parents check their, um, ours go out on Thursday, if they check that message, they can see every reward and consequence that student has got in Live School uh, for the last week. Um, and then we try to work with parents and say, and establish a threshold for the parents. So this is the behaviors that are happening at school. What you should do is set a schedule for your, your child. Get home from school, do this, do this, do this, this. Make that schedule from the time to get home to the time to go to bed. And have a fun schedule and a less than fun schedule. And then your student gets to pick all day long at school which schedule they want when they get home. Do they want the fun schedule or the less than fun schedule? And uh, when you um, the students on the way home, you check, the, uh, you check in in live school. If they met your, your green point criteria and your red point criteria, then they get their fun schedule. If they, if they didn't meet it, they get their, their not fun schedule. And we even have parents, a lot of our parents, you know, they have our students walk home because the student, the parents are still working until five or six at night, but they can still have that communication on the walk home. I looked in live school. I saw you had three red points today. When you get home, make sure you're following the, the consequence schedule. So even our kiddos who are kind of on their own, the parents have more of a connection to what's going on at school and uh, and a way to follow up with the kiddo at home. Um, we have students whose coaches <laughs> check their teach their parents' live school. 
to figure out how they're playing in their uh, basketball game or football game this weekend. So uh, it's super powerful connecting home to school. Um, and then we, uh, our teachers put notes in. So if there are, if there are red points, our teachers, and it's not self-explanatory, like talking out of turn, that one's self-explanatory. But if it's not really self-explanatory, like um, achievement in the restroom, they get a negative. Our teachers put a note in so that their parents are able to follow up. Helps with admin to, to be able to follow up. So those are our six challenges to uh, ensure an authenticity in your PBS systems. And that's what we did here from 2014 to 2017 that really reduced our, our referrals and our uh, exclusionary discipline. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of the work we did. I'm not saying that our uh, what we're doing is perfect, but the, the numbers uh, kind of show that we're, we're having an effect. And uh, I hope that there's something in this presentation that you'll be able to take away that uh, will help you or at least affirm something that you're doing um, so you can you know, be backed up with your, with your teachers that, that you're, you're on the right path and you're doing the right thing and uh, you're gonna get to a, a place where you're proud of your numbers like we are. So that, Jay, we are, that's it. we're getting, mm -hmm. We're getting close to time and I yeah, want to make sure it. if anybody's got a question, they can hop in real quick because I, I know we got folks watching on their planning periods and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I want to be respectful sure. of everybody's time. And <laughs> yes, sir, you've yes, got to go, you've got an Ironman, you got to go run. Yeah. I had one in the chat that um, mm -hmm. I saved for the end. Mm -hmm. um, Jessica asked, would you recommend champs and live school in your system to somebody in middle school? I, I was a middle school teacher forever. Uh, and I really wish I had champs when I was in the middle school. I really wish I did. And uh, I use, when I was a middle school teacher, I used a less effective version of digital currency. Um, and I really wish I had live school. So I 100% think that it's a, that both those things are valid and would be very beneficial. So um, follow up from, from Dave, he asks, how about high school? I, I, yeah, I just can't see why it wouldn't work. I don't, I don't, I, yeah, it just seems, it seems like a no brainer. I think, I think at high school, um, one of the things you want to make sure you're doing is uh, really figuring out what's motivating your kiddos on the positive side, right? Because they're not going to want a pencil topper necessarily. Maybe they do. Maybe they're. Maybe you have some kiddos that are into that in in high school. But really look for what's what's going to motivate them uh, when they get those points, right? And and in the middle school too, the thing that really helped my middle school classes was we did points against each other. So the class with the best points. Uh, uh, got special privileges. So that competition, middle school, high school kids love a little competition. So competing against other classes helps out. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add too, because you mentioned, um, you know, using events and, yes. um, and, and privileges, those things work great with high school, middle school kids. But like that, that, those are great culture builders too. Um, I'll finish with, with one question, then I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll sign us off here. Um, coming back to ex exclusionary disciplines, that's where you started mm -hmm. and that's where you, where you finished. Can you talk about the impact that's had on, on your students, that, that, that big a change? Yeah, I think, I, you know, we've never been in Texas a B-rated school. Uh, and last year we earned a B, right? We have our kids on campus, being part of the culture, uh, being connected to the teachers and growing. And that's, that, that, and that's, that's what everybody wants, right? Uh, I, feel like, I feel like having the kids on campus learning is the most valuable thing we can do and keeping and, and having, it's not magic, right? We're just connecting and uh, identifying our people who need assistance and providing them assistance, you know? And, and doing that is helping us accomplish that goal. Well, Jay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you. If if anybody's got you know further questions, you can you can always send us an email and, and we'll we'll do our best to answer. And all this will come out to your emails shortly after we finish. We'll get it up on uh, YouTube. And uh, Jay, you're going to send me the slides, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, and we'll send you a link to the slides as well. Um, thank you all for joining us, Jay. Thank you very much. No, um, thank you. And everybody have a great day. All right, take care, Lynn.